to the stage, Lamour Freed from Adafruit, Jonathan Grado from Grado Labs, and Jacques Panis from Shinola, as well as our moderator, Matt Burns. You really sink down into these chairs, don't yeah. you? My goodness. Take a well, nap. <laughs> thank you for joining me, everybody. I really do appreciate it, and I apologize to everybody. I'm, as you can tell by my height, I'm clearly not the mayor. So, <laughs> anyway, we're going to talk about hardware today. And we have on stage here, let's start at the far end. We have Jacques Penis, the president of Shinola, Jonathan Grado, VP at Grado Headphone Labs from Brooklyn, and Lamore Freed from Adafruit, of course. Thank you so much. So, thank you. I'll let you guys talk in a minute, but. When I look at your companies, you're all radically different, but you have a fundamentally similar story and go-to-market scheme. So with Shinola at the end here, you guys are based in Detroit. Made in Detroit is the big thing. You guys make bikes, leather goods, mostly watches. And you told me a few weeks ago that you guys are making motors in Detroit, just really tiny motors. I thought that was kind of neat. And then Jonathan, you guys, you have a family business making some of the world's best headphones. Thank you. They're handmade here in Brooklyn, yep. which is really neat. Yeah. And then, then if, if I may, Lady Ada. Hello. Hello. Thank you. You guys are in the business of selling things that makers use to make things. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting. So let, let's start first with the question, why do people make things, tangible objects? You want to start? Deep question. It is, yeah. All right. <laughs> well, I think that um, you know everybody like all humans, we love to create, whether it's art or writing or technology, we love to do things with our hands. It's emotionally fulfilling. And so whether we're making headphones or watches or software or hardware, I think it fulfills this deep need to be creative. Yeah, that, that, that's great. And Jonathan, your family has been doing this for how, how long? 62 years last month. Mm -hmm. 62 years. Give us a brief little history of, of your company. Yeah, so in the early 50s, my great uncle, so my dad's uncle, he started building cartridges at his kitchen table. Um, cartridges? Phono cartridges for turntables. Right, right. So it's that little generator that holds the needle. Mm -hmm. um, he realized that he really liked doing it. We also owned a fruit store at the time. Uh, he went around the corner, closed down the fruit store, and was like, we're going to get into audio. And from 1953, to 1990, we made cartridges, just cartridges. At the end of the 80s, we were doing 10,000 a week, and then one year it just changed to 12,000 for the year, because there are a ton of more things that are more practical than turntables. So um, he was going to close up shop. My dad, who had been doing day-to-day -day business since the 70s, came in, um, bought the company. We lived on the top floor from 90 to 99. And from 1995, um, it was my mom and my dad going downstairs and building all the orders. So we'd get an order for like 10 <laughs> headphones, and it'd be like a party. Um, so while I was building Legos, you were building headphones? I was also playing with Legos, but my parents were yeah, great. downstairs building headphones. Um, so so if, if I will, what keeps your family involved or driving your family to keep on doing this? It's a good question. Um, Thanks. My... <laughs> My great uncle was a master watchmaker, and then he just started tinkering with cartridges and fell in love with it. Uh, my dad trained with him, and he also fell in love with it, but he focused more on building the headphones. And I mean, I used to be embarrassed by my family's company, like when I was a teenager and everything, because no other parents were building these things. So on career day, I'd be the only one who'd come in with headphones around my neck and no one understood what was going on. So I stopped telling people that. Um, and then one day when I was in college a few years ago, I just woke up and was like, I am so dumb. And then I jumped into it. And maybe it's because I was never forced into the family company. Like they still tell me like, you should just go out and do something else. And I'm like, no, no, this is, yeah, that's this is really what I want to do. So it's ingrained in you. And, and Jacques, your company, Shinola in Detroit, how many people do you employ making watches and leather goods? We're up to about 400 people total globally, and uh, a little over two-thirds of, of the 400 are in Detroit. And what have you found? What's the reason people come to you to make 
the movements inside of watches? Is there something? So just let me unique? clarify real quick, Matt, because uh, uh, the, the made and the make and the, the, the terminology can be misstrued, and, and we, we, we like to be very clear and authentic with how we present what we're doing in Detroit. We're actually building movements, and we're building watches, and we're building bicycles in Detroit. Our leather goods, we can say, are made in the United States. Um, but unfortunately, given the industry today and, and where we stand here in the United States in terms of making componentry for watches, we have to source components in from all over the world, as we do with bicycles. Um, and then our movement components come from Switzerland, and we assemble everything there in Detroit. So, so describe the, uh, the process involved, because the, the made in Detroit part, you guys actually built a watch factory recently in Detroit. So you um, built everything. Yeah, it could be argued that that was the dumbest move ever, but uh, we did it anyway. And uh, it's been an incredible journey. Uh, we've been able to train actually, uh, train local Detroiters to, to make watches, to build watches in Detroit, and to build movements in Detroit which has been very exciting. It's an industry that left our shores uh, just at about 50 years ago. And uh, today is alive and well again in Detroit, Detroit, Michigan of all places. So, so the company Shinola, when, when you were looking for a place to house the company, you did a nationwide search, correct? We did. Was there a practical reason in choosing Detroit or was it just something, a uh, marketing uh, well, you touched on it a minute ago. You know, we're, we are making motors. Our motors power our watches. They're a little quartz motor that's, that's powered by a battery. And, um, you know, so if you want to make a motor in this country, there's not really a better place than the Motor City. And then when you get to the Motor City and you meet the people that are in that place or in that town, uh, you realize that there's something special there. And, uh, and, you know, the city and the community has really given us the, the good old bear hug. And, and we realized that very early on, that, that the people there want better. And they want to move not just that region, but they want to move our country down the road and, and bring back manufacturing. And, and bring back manufacturing at a level of quality uh, that we like to represent at Shinola sure. as well. Now, now, Jonathan, you guys make your headphones here in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Why do you still do high-tech manufacturing here in Brooklyn or assembling? Um, so we're in a, people come and visit us and expect like what they see is like the entrance to something bigger. But then at the end, I'm like, no, that was it. Like, <laughs> there's nothing more okay. than that. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's that my dad is really happy being in that building and being that close to the product. Um, he still goes in six and a half days a week. Um, he's a big fan of the machines that don't have software because he can get in there and fix it. And then we right. have one machine that does run on software and it breaks. We have to call in a specialist and that's when he gets frustrated and stuff. But like the old machines from the 40s, those are still our work cars, horses. He still gets in there and fixes it. Um, but yeah, it's just our family's been there. So, so I guess a better question would be, could Grado headphones be Grado headphones if they were made elsewhere? We could still get the sound to sound as good as they do, but the story would be different. And we're not into that. That's good. So you're going to stay here for the long run? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty okay. sure. Yeah. How many people do you guys employ in Brooklyn? Um, at the whole company, there's like 20. 17 are in Brooklyn and three work remotely. Mm -hmm. So... So, so you guys sell your product based on story and more. That, that's very true for you guys as well, right? Mm -hmm. What do you see as your competitive edge? Um, I think by far the competitive edge that Adafruit has is what you learn, the knowledge, and the story behind it. I mean, we actually do have the best designed electronics, and we do have excellent customer service, which does help. But Adafruit, I position Adafruit as like a tutorial company. Like, we teach you a skill, which is, you know, soldering or electronics or microcontrollers or firmware or whatever. Um, and then, you know, you follow our tutorials. We have like 800 tutorials now on our, our right. site. And then at the end, it's like, did you like this tutorial? Would you like to follow it? Click here to add to your cart. And that's, that's how Adafruit works, and it's really good because we get to focus on the quality of instruction and the quality of the goods. I mean, they have to work out of the box. Like, it can't be flakier or, you know, a difficult experience. And then once people have that first 
unboxing experience learning, they're like, wow, that was actually not so hard. Like, I can become a maker. I can do electronics design. They become addicted to it, which is good. So who do you guys see as your key customer then? Oh, like everybody. I mean, a, a lot of the customers we have right now, the growing market we see is um, cosplay, actually. A lot of people who do cosplay at, at, you know, I don't know if you've been to like Comic-Con here or other um, events, but there's a lot of people who go there and they want to build costumes and they want to integrate sound or effects or lights. Um, we also have a lot of young people who are really into fashion and they want to do wearable mm -hmm. electronics. So like, you know, we we build like wearable electronics like this Flora, which is a Every Sobel. Every time you come here, you bring toys. Yeah, of course. That's great. Pockets. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you <laughs> sew this onto your costume, um, and then you can have it have light effects or sound or Bluetooth energy or Wi-Fi. And it's actually really easy. You don't have to go to MIT and spend $100,000. You can learn all this stuff on a weekend. How much do you contribute the success of your company directly to you getting out there and being the visible face to this company? Uh, I think it's important to have a face because for every company, the culture comes from above. Mm -hmm. right? The CEO sets the culture. And so even though we have, you know, 85 people or so, um, you know, what I set up 10 years ago with this company is what continues. And so the values that I put into it, I think, is what people see in Adafruit and also what the employees see. So I think it's, I think it's sure. important for the CEO to set the culture and then continue to uh, disseminate it. Right, great. Let's switch gears a little bit here. Let's talk about crowdfunding. Crowdfunding has exploded over the last few years, right? Everything from buying kits that you guys sell to selling headphones and then watches are all people, things are people trying to attempt to crowdfund and start. Now, Jacques, think back to when, you, when Shinola started. Would it be possible for a company to raise enough money through crowdfunding to even build a watch domestically? I, I guess it depends on the scale, Matt. I'm not an expert on crowdfunding by any means. How, how much money do you think it would take to, to start a small watch company, a bespoke guy, here in the States? I don't know. It depends on, again, what you want to do, right? I mean, right. if you want to make a couple of watches a year, you can start it up in a bedroom. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, but if you want to make a case and you want to make the crystal and you want to make the crown and, you know, make a watch... Like, you know, there are some makers here in the United States, uh, mm -hmm. and there's a guy in Pennsylvania who's making, you know, I don't know how many he makes a year, but uh, he's doing it at an old bank. Um, you know, so I, I don't know, man, to be honest with you, what, no, what no. kind of money you would need to raise. Uh, probably, you know, a, a little to a lot. How's that? <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, do you ever see a situation where a company would turn to crowdfunding to, to start a product or um, pay for a product? I don't think so. Um, we've never taken any kind of funding, but I know whenever some big Kickstarter success happens, my mom will come like, why can't we just raise like $2 million over? And I'm like, it's not that easy. We can't just do that. Um, yeah, I'm not a... I'm not a funding right. expert or anything like that. Yeah, no, that's fair. <laughs> Crowdfunding has really exploded, but then there's been a lot of failures with it as well. Mm. And Lamore, when you look at all this stuff, and people come to you to prototype a lot, right? Mm. We actually, yeah, we see Kickstarters, and I'm like, that's an Adafruit thing, an Adafruit thing. Like, I see it a lot. Right, One sure. Of the electronics ones, easily 20, 25%. What, what do you think people are doing wrong with the, with the crowdfunding? Um, I think that... You know, there's a lot that goes right with crowdfunding, so I don't think it's like, you know, if you do crowdfunding, you're making a mistake. I think that the people who use crowdfunding as one tool in their toolbox mm -hmm. are the ones who can get the most out of it. I think, you know, I think of the Kickstarters that I know that have been really successful. It's been people who actually have taken something to manufacture before, and, and so they're like, this is just an evolution of a previous product I did. Like, you know, I already made headphones, now these headphones just have, you know, a slightly different uh, effect. Maybe they have Bluetooth built in, mm -hmm. audio Bluetooth. But I've designed the headphones. I know how to uh, build and, and get sure. cones and, and do the power management and all that stuff. The, those people succeed. Not always, but usually. Right. Um, the ones that struggle are people who um, I think they look at you know, the electronic market and they say, how hard can that be? Like, how hard can it be to make a watch? I mean, you could buy like a Casio for two bucks. Like, it can't be that hard. Right. And they don't realize 
the decades of experience that are required to, to get to that point. Um, so I think that, I think crowdfunding is, is only the first part, but if you have experience with design for manufacture, you can, you can use it properly. Right. If you end your crowdfunding campaign and they're, now you're like, okay, all I have to do is hire an engineer, you're gonna have a bad time. Right, right. Jonathan, you're, you're smiling over here. What do you see as the big pain point in training people to build your products? Luckily, most of our staff has been with us for over a decade. We don't really have a high turnover rate. Um, so I haven't had to train anyone. Um, so I guess I'm looking forward to that. But I think it's just you need to sharpen that skill. Right. With our cartridges, we tip our cartridges with diamonds, and then if the diamond doesn't go on just right, the whole entire piece needs to be scrapped. Sure. So it's just that practice. And, then, and the jockey, I mean, you guys have the same, very microscopic. I've been to your, your watch factory, and it's quite astounding. It's right in Detroit. Yep. It's in right by the old General Motors facilities. And you have this clean room where you have people assembling absolutely microscopic parts. How do you train somebody to do that? Or what do you look for? Well, you look, I mean, there's, there's a visual test and a dexterity test and overall aptitude test that people take. Um, but the beautiful thing is we've been able to train people to assemble the movements and the watches. And, um, you know, we, we look for obviously a steady hand, uh, and, but we, we really look for people that have character about them uh, and people that are willing to learn something new. And that's what we've found in Detroit, are, are people that have this incredible will and desire to want to make things and, uh, and, and have the patience. I don't know that people understand how difficult it is to sit and do the same thing a thousand times a day. If you've never been into a factory, it might be hard to wrap your head around that, but seeing someone do the same thing a thousand times a day uh, it helps you understand how challenging it is. Um, you know, I uh, for me, I, I don't know that I could do that job uh, to sit right. and, and do the same thing time and time and time again. Um, but we've been very fortunate in finding people who pour their heart and their soul into each and every watch or bicycle uh, or leather good that, that leaves our factories and our facilities in Detroit. What, what are you working on now that you're most excited about? What are we working on now? Well, we're working on expanding our capabilities of leather manufacturing in Detroit. Today we make about 50% of our leather straps are made in Detroit. The other 50% are made down in Largo, Florida with a, a different manufacturer. But we'd like to expand our ability to make uh, tech accessories. Uh, so iPad cases, covers, bags, wallets, et cetera, uh, there in Detroit. And so we have to train people to be able to do that. Could we see a Shinola watch band for the Apple Watch sometime? Oh boy, I'm waiting for that. <laughs> Look, our stance on the, on, on the Apple Watches was that uh, our watch is so smart you can look at it, uh, it can tell you time just by looking at it. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's kind of all I have to say about the Apple Watch at this <laughs> that's point. fantastic, <laughs> I like that. Jonathan, what, what are you guys working on here in Brooklyn now? Um, well, we don't come out with new headphones every eight to 12 months like some other companies. I mean, how, how many products has your company had in the history? 13, 14, just headphones, not cartridges. Um, there's a lot more of those. I mean, our first headphone came out in the early 90s, and then some headphones were sprinkled into the lineup until 2007. In 2007, they got a whole revamp, and then mm -hmm. this past June was a third generation. Um, but we are working on some limited editions, and I think we're farther enough along to talk about um, we're our next limited edition headphone, we're making headphones out of Brooklyn trees. So we're taking trees from around where Grado is in Sunset Park and making headphones out of those. That's cool. So that's like the most Brooklyn we're going to get right now. Yeah, that, that's hip. That's yeah. pretty Brooklyn. <laughs> the hipsters will like that, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. <coughs> oh, only one person at Grado even knows what the word hipster is, and that's me. Like, I'm the youngest <laughs> one there by like 35 years. Well, I, I, we're out of time, and I think that's a fantastic uh, place to end it. Thank you so much for joining me on yeah. stage Thank you. today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, good. Matt. Thank you all.